everybody. If you're looking for information on how to start running when you're over 40, you are in the right place. Welcome to my talk, everything you need to know to start running when you're 40. In this seminar, we are going to cover should you start running, how to start running, what things you should buy to start running, which plan to follow, if any at all, what considerations you should have around signing up for races, and also how to stay motivated once you have decided to start running. We'll start with introductions. My name is Susie and I am the host of a YouTube channel as well as a podcast called I Run Things. I am a 48 year old runner. I started running when I was 42 and before that, I had hardly done any strategic training whatsoever in any real capacity. The only exposure I had to exercise really was in high school. And once I entered college, I abandoned exercise completely, other than maybe the occasional walk. I was always fascinated by runners, though. I saw people running on the street and I wondered what really does it take to be a runner? Could I be one? Why do people go out there and run constantly? Are they running from someone? What's in it that people seem so happy when they're outside running? I was eager to uncover all of that. And then my brother gave me a little push. He was trying to lose weight like many of us while we're going through our mid years. And he decided to take on running. And silly me, I thought he needed a push, so I told him, I will sign up for a race of your choice if you'll have me. Again, I thought maybe he needed a push, but little did I know, he was the one who pushed me. About a month after I made this promise to my brother, he had signed us up for our first 10K. Now, for those of you who don't know, a 10K is 6.2 miles. It's kind of considered middle distance and I will go into more detail as to what's long distance and what's short distance later on in this video. But needless to say, here I was with an entry for a 10K, 6.2 miles, and I had not run a mile in 30 years. Well, really, I don't think I have run ever a mile because I'm from Spain. We have kilometers there. I went through my whole high school education and part of college in Spain and there we only run a kilometer when we are actually doing trials of any kind. So really the most I had ever run was one kilometer and I would not call what I was doing running. I walked most of it. And here's where the fun really started. My brother was training in Spain and I was training here in the United States and we motivated each other to find a training plan that we could actually tackle throughout the distance that would keep us motivated and bring us to the start line healthy and get us through to the finish line, which really was no easy task because neither one of us was a runner. I am going to ask all of you guys watching this talk, how long do you think it took us to train for this 10K? Think about it, 6.2 miles, coming from no exercise whatsoever. Well, he really only took us 12 weeks. so. If you're watching this video, I am here to tell you, you too can run when you're in your 40s. Let's talk about how. Now, of course, if you landed here is because you are in that age category of over 40. Now, if you were to ask me, what, how can you start running when you're in your 40s? I will tell you, you need exactly the same thing that you need as a younger you. Motivation and a healthy body. Once a doctor has cleared you for exercise, 100% all of us could run. So I encourage you, if you're curious about running, to talk to your medical provider and have them clear you for exercise. And just follow the suggestions in this video. Okay, so we are going to talk about a myth that really we should put on the table and destroy it. No one leaves out the door in their own houses and runs more than maybe 
a mile. And even that would be a stretch. If you come from no exercise whatsoever or even non-aerobic exercise, I would think 99% of us are not capable of really running more than a minute at a time. Hence why I would recommend highly that you set up a plan in which you're going to be running and walking. This is called the Run Walk program and it was brought really to the masses by Jeff Galloway who's an Olympian and who completed many of his races run walking them. Why do I recommend you start run walking? Well first of all you're going to see improvements really quickly. The way to do this is to run for a certain amount of time and then walk that same amount of time. So if you can sustain 30 seconds running, that's fine. Go out for 30 seconds and then walk the next 30 seconds. Then run again 30 seconds, then walk again 30 seconds. I do recommend you get very tactical with this because the more tactical you are, the more structured your approach, the faster you are going to get to running most of the time and not needing to walk as much. The first approach should always be to go out for these run walk intervals three times a week. Ideally, you have 30 minutes in which you can do this on Tuesday, on a Thursday. You can run Tuesday and Thursday, for example, or Monday and Wednesday. And then one day during the weekend, either Saturday or Sunday, you're going to try and run longer than those 30 minutes. Now, at first, you're not going to be able to do a longer period, but over time, you should try and increase two minutes, three minutes, four minutes, five minutes till that run gets to be 60, 70 minutes. That is doable over time. And you will see that every single week you feel better, you feel stronger, you feel more confident, and you'll be able to accomplish more. Okay, so now I am going to put right here a sample of what I mean by this. So Monday, you will do your run walk intervals. You will start 30 seconds running, 30 seconds walking till you complete 30 minutes. Then Wednesday, you will do exactly the same thing. And then Saturday, you will try and do 40 minutes. Again, doing these intervals. What happens the second week? On the second week, you could try and increase those running intervals. You can do 40, 45 seconds running, 30 seconds walking, and then repeat like that, but still keep your runs your whole workout to 30 minutes so do 30 minutes on monday 30 minutes on wednesday and then 40 minutes on saturday now once you've been doing this for three to four weeks your body is going to ask you for more and how do you give your body more you can either add one more day of exercise or increase the intensity of those workouts. So you can either, again, keep increasing the portion that you're running and keeping those 30 seconds of walking the same, or you can run more. Instead of running 30 minutes, you could attempt to run 40 minutes Monday, Wednesday, and then Saturday, increase your long run as well. And that, my friends, is the gist of it. The reality is if you train like this for 12 weeks, you are ready to run at the bare minimum a 5k which is 3.1 miles and like my brother and i you can be ready for a 10k 6.2 miles really the number one thing that you need to run to be a runner is consistency there's nothing else you need motivation at the beginning you need that spark that brings you to try and become healthier or maybe tackle a challenge. You need to be motivated for that first time you get up for a run. But after that, all you need is consistency. You need discipline. You need to be committed to, the, to yourself, make a promise to yourself, and then go out there and get it done. Now, of course, running has multiple benefits. Number one, Running is a weight-bearing exercise and it's going to make not only your muscles stronger, but also your bones stronger. This is particularly of interest for women in our menopausal year, 
menopausal years and post menopause. Running, like any other aerobic exercise, will also keep your cholesterol, your sugar, and your blood pressure in check. So it's really good for us to maintain a healthy body and also to keep those diseases at bay, those metabolic diseases. Now, if you're doing this to lose weight, the unfortunate thing is that you're probably going to be very hungry at first when you start running. Running burns so many calories that it's going to be very hard to control that hunger. Runners call this runger because you get home so ravenous, there's not enough food in the fridge to feed you. This is a natural consequence of, again, just running and, and the amount of calories that you burn doing this exercise. So if you decide to start running because you want to lose weight, I would engage a nutritionist or a dietitian that's exposed to working with runners so that they can advise you on the best protocol to follow. And now we are going to talk about the fun part. What do you need to start running? Well, you need really two things. Number one thing, the most important one, is shoes. My recommendation, if you're a new runner, is always to get fitted for shoes. Now, over time, you will know what works for you and what doesn't. And if you stick with this thing called running, you're gonna know immediately if a new pair of shoes is meant to be or not meant to be. There are certain things that make you try on a shoe and decide that is really the shoe you wanna run on. And sometimes when you go to the source, they are going to recommend something that is not exactly 100% what you enjoy running on. If that's the case, just make sure before you purchase that pair that you can return it if you don't enjoy running in them anymore. Just find out what the policy is for returns. Some stores will let you return it after a couple of weeks, others won't. So just find out what that policy is for returns so that you don't get shoes that you're never going to be happy with. Now, when you're a runner, there's basically two kinds of runners. Well, really there's three, but one of these types of runners is um, only like 3% of the population. So hopefully you're not in that 3% because it's very hard to find shoes for these 3%. So now let's talk about the two different kinds of shoes you can find for these 97% of the population who run best in these two types of shoes. The best group is the neutral running shoe. These kind of shoes have no stabilizing features and they just let you run the way that you're meant to run. There's another type of shoes called stability shoes, and those are for runners who pronate. Now, most of us really pronate a little bit, but it's in most of us, it's not enough to need a corrective shoe. If you pronate, you roll your ankle inward this way. If you pronate a lot, you need a stability shoe that corrects that rolling of your ankle with every step you take. Now, if you're wondering what kind of runner you are, you should look at your shoes, your running shoes, and then check where they are worn out. If they are worn here towards the interior of your foot, you will need a stability shoe, you prony. If they were out evenly here and here, then you're a neutral runner. Now, what happens to that 3% of runners I told you at the beginning that don't need either a neutral shoe or a stability shoe, those are over pronators and they go like this. They roll outwards. Now, this is something that must be corrected in a different way. For this group, I really, really encourage you not to buy a shoe without asking a foot specialist because you might need a specific brand and a specific type of shoe. Now, what happens if you run in the shoes that are not meant for you? First of all, you're going to be uncomfortable and second, eventually, you will get injured. Some runners get injured straight away, like after using that shoe three or four times. Other runners, it takes a little bit longer, but inevitably, you're going to be hurting and you're going to injure yourself because that shoe is going to be changing your gait. 
Now there are different types of shoes and this is a topic in which if you ask any runner, they can talk hours and hours and hours about shoes. But needless to say, basically there's four different types of shoes that you can buy and that you really, in my opinion, should have once you have decided running is a serious hobby. You're going to dedicate part of your day to. First type of shoe is just the overall trainer. This shoe is very comfortable. It's probably not the lightest shoe you're going to own. And it's just a shoe that you can run 300, 400 miles on and just be perfectly happy and perfectly content. There are many brands out there that have phenomenal, phenomenal trainers. To mine comes the New Balance 1020, either the version 10, the version 11, they just released the version 12. That's a really good overall running shoe. The Asics Nabo Blast, another phenomenal, phenomenal trainer. Um, but there are many, all the different brands um, have their own specific trainer. And again, you should go out and just try them and see which one is for you. The second kind of shoe that you should have in your rotation is the tempo run. So once you start adding miles, once you maybe run your first race, you're going to want to tackle some speed work, some, tem some tempo work, so that you can get faster, get stronger as a runner. So while your trainers are those shoes that you will use for most of your runs that you're going to just use to put some miles on them, some serious miles on, a tempo shoe is more a shoe that's lighter, that gets your legs to turn over faster and just do a little bit more intensity work sustain intensity work. So let's imagine your pace, and I'm just gonna make a round number, is 11 minute miles when you're doing easy miles. If you wanna pick up a pace, you might wanna do 10 minute miles. The tempo shoes are specific for those 10 minute miles. They're a little bit faster than most of your miles, but not as fast as you would run a race, for example. Now, because tempo means a different thing to every runner out there and basically any training plan has a different definition of what tempo means, I'm hesitant to suggest a shoe. Again, my best advice would be to go to the store and try them on. This shoe though is going to be typically a little less cushiony and a little bit faster and it's not going to be as comfortable as your overall trainer. The third shoe you should have in your rotation is my favorite, and these are the racing flats. Now, racing flats are on its own a category, and I love these kind of shoes. Very good shoes for me are the Asics Hyperspeed. They discontinued them a couple years ago, and they brought them back because runners wanted to have them back. I own a pair, and it's my third pair that I own, and I love these shoes. They're super light, and they're great for a race for like a 5k race, maybe a mile, your shorter distance. They don't have a lot of support, not a lot of cushioning. So again, I would be mindful of not putting a lot of miles on them because you might be taxing your legs too much, but they are perfect, perfect to race in them. And then a recent category that has been just added by brands very recently, you might even have heard of them, are carbon plate shoes. Carbon plate shoes, every brand again has their own version of carbon plate shoes. They have a carbon plate fiber plate on the sole of the shoe and they promise to make you run faster. Now I own carbon plate shoes. I don't know that they make me run faster in my personal opinion. Again, this is very difficult to really measure because they would have to clone me and use the same shoes and have me and my cloned me run the same race under the same circumstances and see which one runs faster if the carbon plate shoes or other shoes. Since we can't do that, I don't know that this is true. And there are studies out there that say that it is or that it is not. What I do think is that the carbon plate shoes are much easier on your bone structure. When I use them, I feel less tired, less sore the following day. So for what it's worth, I do think there's a place for carbon plate shoes. They are expensive. 
Some of them are upwards of $250 for those of us in the United States. Now, you can't be constantly, and if you can, kudos to you. <laughs> but it's a very expensive kind of shoe, and yeah, you have to use them sparingly. I own two pairs, and I'm kind of reserving them for upcoming marathon. Now that we have talked about shoes, we are going to talk about the second piece that I mentioned you need. So on top of shoes, you need good clothes. Now, you don't need to have a lot, especially when you start running, you can wash them. Ideally, you're not gonna be running every single day, so you can wash them in between. There's um, good brands out there, you can spend a lot of money buying running clothes. There's plenty of opportunities to do that. However, I always recommend starting with something that's tried and true, um, something you can ask your friends if you have running friends and you can find information in many, Facebook has a lot of running groups as well. Ask for things that really work and things that you can wash many times. I find that there are clothes that are very expensive that tend to not wash well and clothes that might not be as expensive that really you don't need to care for them as intensely and they take, you can wash them a lot, they don't fade, they don't break. So it's always good to ask around. Good quality clothing is always better, but not necessarily that is reflected in the price of the item of clothing. Now, if you're a woman, it's very important to have a good bra um, for obvious reasons. Um, bras can get very, very uncomfortable. So this is the number one thing I recommend. Go try them out. This is even in my book more important than trying out shoes. They really need to feel comfortable because if you chafe, you're going to be miserable. Really, really miserable. You can chafe in places that you don't even you don't even know existed. So a good quality bra can make your life so much easier so yeah try them on find a good one that fits your structure we also should talk i said that there's two things that you need really there's a third but it's part of clothing you should buy so socks are extremely important my mantra to you guys should be repeat this have it in your head don't use cotton socks ever they absorb the water and they're gonna get your the worst blisters ever so if you cannot afford the fancy brand or you want to you don't want to invest the money it's not that you can't afford it it's that you don't want to put that investment early on in your running career i would recommend you avoid cotton pretty much everything else you're gonna be cool with even wool okay wool is actually fantastic for rainy races or rainy runs if it's raining outside and you wear wool they're phenomenal for that but avoid at all cost cotton avoid cotton everywhere as a matter of fact but especially for your socks because that's just like no no the blisters oh my god this is gonna be bad guys don't do it okay so now we are going to talk about training plans and training philosophy if you Google running training plan for a half or for a 10 miler for a marathon, you are going to find so many different plans out there. There are many different training philosophies. It's hard to hone in the training plan that's going to work for you. Now, I've been running five years. I've run six marathons, plenty of half marathons. And I have to say, this is the piece that took me the longest to really understand. Your body reacts to training in a different way. So I could be doing one plan along my friend who's running the same pace as I am running and she might do extremely well on that plan and I may get injured. And this actually happened to me with a plan that me and my friend chose to run a marathon. She nailed it she did really really well and i got injured twice on the same plan so you have to be mindful and really try not to try to do too much always when you are looking at a plan try and be conservative most plans will ask you certain questions and you can sort of see how you fit into that plan 
plants have like they have you running four days a week five days a week six days a week every single day during the week and then they also give you an overall mile for the week that you're going to be running so i would look at both and always be conservative and try and not aim too high so if you think you can do 40 miles maybe don't sign up for the 40 mile plan sign up for the 30 mile plan because life gets in the way sometimes and it's much easier to up the miles than it is to try and water down the plan you're on and do less miles. So food for thought, I've done that in the past, just don't do it. Always sign up for a plan that's a little bit under what you think you can do, and then you can up and do more miles if you wish to do so. Now, repeatable plans out there are um, Hansen's, very good plan, Hal Higdon, that's the plan that I followed for my most recent Brooklyn Half Marathon, and I absolutely nailed it. Hal Higdon works really well with my body. I really like it. I see myself progressing with Hal Higdon really quickly. You have Macmillan plants as well. You have Jeff Galloway. There are numerous, numerous plants out there. Now, there's really a big difference in between plants that require you to run all the time and plants that allow you to walk. So if you are a runner that wants to be able to walk, you should choose a plan that allows for that. Not all of them are built in a way that you will see improvements if you walk in the middle of a run. And I'm thinking, for example, Hansen's. If you are not able to run all the way, you're not gonna see those improvements happen. Whereas if you choose a how Higdon, you will be able to walk in certain types of runs because that is embedded in the plan. Now, if you have decided that you want to run, walk, a race, I actually made a few videos about this on my channel, my YouTube channel, because I think it's a valid, valid way of completing a marathon, for example. I have run a, mar a couple of marathons actually with run, walk, and I did really, really well. So what run, walk, eight means is that you're going to, like I suggested you start running, you're going to run for a portion of time, maybe five minutes running, and then walk one minute. And you take those walk breaks all the way through your race. Now this is ideal for the marathon because what this does is twofold. Number one, it breaks the marathon in smaller chunks. Marathons are very long. You're out there for a very long time and you're, it's taxing on your body. How do you eat an elephant? You eat that elephant in smaller chunks. You can actually just break it into smaller pieces and your brain operates under a structured approach all throughout that race, which I think is beneficial for a lot of us. So you might want to give it a try if you're attempting to run a marathon, for example, and you don't think you're capable of it. I guarantee you, pretty much anybody can run a marathon using run walk. Now the key to the run walk methodology is that you need to start doing it from the very beginning. What happens when you run a marathon is many people around mile 20, kilometer 32, you hit the wall because you depleted all your glycogen stores. And I'm gonna touch on that after this. Um, by run walking, you give your body that opportunity to bring that heart rate down again, and you're not going through those glycogen stores as quickly as if you were running the whole time. So it's a great method to avoid hitting the wall. And I've used the run walk method six marathons, three times. So half of my marathons, I've used the run walk methodology, and I didn't hit the wall in neither one of those three which I did on the marathons where I didn't use the run walk. I ran the whole way. So, and not necessarily I ran them faster. So my overall time was not necessarily faster. So, but that's a whole other topic for another talk. Now, what kind of food should you eat when you are a runner? Anything over three kilometers, really 2.1, 2.2 miles is considered long distance. It's all aerobic. There's nothing anaerobic about it. And the difference in between that is aerobic means with oxygen, anaerobic mean, means without oxygen. 
I'm not going to get into the scientific details of what that means, but for intensive purposes, anything over three kilometers, you're going to be going through a lot of oxygen. Your body's going to intake a lot of oxygen and there's things happening in your body and you're going to need a lot of carbs. Now, how many carbs? If you're a big person, you're going to need more carbs. Obviously, you need more of everything. You need more calories as well. If you're a smaller person, you're going to need less carbohydrates. There is such a thing as carb loading. If you are a more seasoned runner, I think two hours. Under two hours, you don't need to carb load because your body has gotten that process nailed down pretty well. But if you're a new runner, anything over 90 minutes, you really should be carb loading the night before. Just maybe have rice, pasta, bread, anything the whole wheat. It's really usually better. But whatever you fancy, whatever your body's used to eating, that's what you should eat. So don't eat anything new the day before a long run um, or the morning of a long run. And of course, 100% don't eat anything new the night before. I would say the day before a race or the morning before a race. Just don't because you don't know if you're going to get sick and that's not fun, guys. It's stressful to run a race. So if you have to go to the porta potty, it's even more stressful. So don't do it. Nothing new on race day, especially when it comes to food. And now we are going to talk about my favorite topic, racing. So how do you choose a race? How do you know if a race is right for you? Like with plants, the opportunities to race in this country, in the United States, where I'm filming this, are a plenty. All throughout the world, there are many, many different kinds of races. You have them short, you have them long, you have them on asphalt, you have them through very touristic places, you have them in the winter, you have them in the summer, in the fall, in the spring. There's so many options for you to choose. Now, my first recommendation, if you're a new runner, is to choose one that's very convenient for you to get there. Try avoiding sleeping somewhere else. If you can sleep in your own house, drive yourself to the race, that is always the best option for your first race because there are so many things you cannot control. It's better not to add more things like, am I going to sleep well the prior night? Am I going to find the food that I enjoy eating the night before? Um, am I going to be able to find the fuel? Am I going to be able to carry it with me? Where's the expo if I need to get a bib? How many runners are running this thing? Just it's much better to control what you can control. So don't add a lot of stuff to the mix because that's going to be a detriment to your performance in that race. Now, my suggestions always is to try and get to that race well rested, sleep well the week before, try and have two or three nights before, really sleep really well if you can do it. If you're not nervous, if you can manage to do that, that's always the best thing. Sleep in my book is even more important than food is. So there are as many races as types of runners. You want to could argue. My favorite ones in terms of distance, the marathon still reigns supreme to me. Um, I find that the half marathon right now at the paces that I'm running, it's kind of like there. Yes, it gets me a challenge, but I feel a lot more challenged when I'm running a marathon and that's what I'm looking for. I want to be challenged. I want it to be hard and marathons are super hard. And in terms of what types of races, again, there's so many different kinds. You can run on asphalt in a city. You can run on trails, which it requires different technique. And there's a lot more walking in trail running than just because of the terrain and the altitude and the incline and the hills. It's really almost a different type of sport. And then you have fun races like the Disney races, for example. They're super, super fun, um, very accessible to runners. When you're looking for a race, always make sure you understand the cutoff time. Most races have a cutoff with the exception of maybe New York City Marathon, for example, does not have a cutoff. They take runners, race starts early in the morning and they're taking runners to 2 a.m. on the following day. So that might be the only one that has like big race that does not have a cutoff time. Most races have a minimum pace that you must adhere to if you want to be able to get the medal at the end, cross the finish line like every other runner. Um, there's a thing called DNF, which means do not finish. 
you want to finish every race if you can. Again, there's no shame in not finishing if you're risking your health. If you're risking your health, if you get injured, do not finish. There's no shame in not finishing. But ideally, all runners want to cross the finish line and get the medal. That's what we run. And then you can display your medals in your house and all, everybody's gonna be asking you about them when they come over and it's just the most wonderful feeling. Now, how do you fuel during a race? Most races under 3.1 miles, five kilometers, are not going to necessarily have fuel on the course or water on the course, unless you're running in the middle of the summer and it's really hot, then probably the organizers are gonna have waters, water tables throughout the course. Usually you start having water and Gatorade or similar branded type of electrolyte drink in over 6.2. 10 kilometers and over is when you start having those water tables. Now, typically the water tables are long. They're gonna have volunteers handing out water and it's wise to find out on the race's website what's coming first. Does water come first or is Gatorade coming first or a similar drink? and water comes second. Because my recommendation always is always to skip the first table and go towards the end. Most people stop to drink, they grab the water and they walk through at the tables. If you're a new runner, there's no, well, there's never, I mean, don't feel ashamed for walking. I still walk through the water tables and I've been doing this five years. So there's no shame in that. Do you, do you continue running and you try and aim for one of the later tables? of the drink of your choice. If you have decided to drink water, find out if they come first or later. And then if you prefer the electrolyte drink, know where that's going to come and always go towards the last table. Now, what's the difference in between one and the other? This also comes with experience. I usually start fueling with gels, which is this little, they come like in a pouch and it's basically sugar and electrolytes. There are many different brands. The cheapest one of all is Goo. That's the one that I prefer, again, because it's cheap and my stomach accepts it really well. If you are starting to run longer distances, it's a good idea to practice running those longer runs with Goose or with the gel of your choice. You can find them from like dollar and a half to really expensive. I've seen some at like upwards of $8. So it's up to you and to your stomach which one you feel better using. When you're in a race, typically you eat one of these gels every 45 minutes. Um, or maybe you go by distance every like three miles, four miles. Again, it depends on what you feel good doing, what your body accepts. Ideally, the more carbohydrates you're taking during a race, the better because you're burning them so fast that if you can replenish that, it's really, really good. But usually when you're running, your stomach is not good at just going through a lot of carbs. So there's always a limit and we all have a limit. So find out what your limit is because you don't wanna cross that bit line the day of a race and then have to, again, use the party body and not be able to finish or slow down. So find out what amount of carbohydrates is good for you and works for you. For me, it's every 45 minutes, one gel. So at the beginning of races, you usually have gel and water. Again, I take as much water as I can take without having to stop to the bathroom. And I kind of know that again by experience because depending on the temperature in the day, how much I'm sweating, I'm really good at controlling that. And you will in time as well, but it takes practice. The more you race, the more you will nail this down. So the more you race, the better runner you're going to become. That's the reality. In longer races, like half marathon, for example, after a mile nine, I will change my strategy and I would not take water and gels anymore. And I will switch to either Gatorade or Powerade, whatever they offer on the course. Now, my stomach is kind of bulletproof that way, so I can take anything, even if it's a new flavor. Uh, but I would always recommend to new runners that you guys test everything first. Again, you don't want to have an upset stomach in the middle of your important race. You want to finish happy, you want to finish smiling, and you want to finish that race wanting to sign up for another one again. 
Branding is a sport that has given me so much. I have met so many new friends through running. I have my channel, my YouTube channel, and my podcast because of my running. I just love sharing what I've learned with others and I love others sharing with me. And if you're watching this talk, I would love for you to come and subscribe to my channel. I hope you do. Again, if you Google me as I run things, I'll be there, I'll pop on Google. So yeah, and if you see me, if you did start running and you see me at any race, please stop me and say hello. I love meeting people who I got to inspired a little bit. If you have any questions, you can email me at the email that will be here. I will post my Instagram as well, so you can follow me on Instagram if you wanna do that and find more motivation. I run almost every day. I think right now I'm running six days a week. I hope this inspires you to start running. I hope you find joy in running. And as I always say, if you run purposely, you're a runner. I mean, if you run after your kid, because the kid is going into the street or something, that's not purposely running. It's kind of an emergency, then no. But any other time you go out and you run, even if it's only 30 seconds out of every minute, even if it's only 15 seconds out of every minute, you are a runner. I love you guys. Run fearless.